by Riverside. Welcome back to the Movement for Life podcast. My name is Colby Christofik. Uh, this is the podcast that we talk about ways that keep us moving throughout our life. Today, we are going to talk about uh, recovery. We're going to talk a little bit more information about the science behind recovery. The idea of how we can optimize some of our rest days. So we're going to have some fun talking about a couple of different things. But before I do, we get to start our week talking about some of the th ways that we moved in the previous week. For me, this past week, some of the ways that I moved, I did some CrossFit workouts twice last week. So I'm just coming off of lifeguard season, getting back into some CrossFit. So I did CrossFit twice last week. Then I went out to the islands, the Channel Islands, Santa Cruz on a sailboat. And I did, got to do some swimming out at the islands, and I got to do some dinging around. Um, dinging around maybe sounds really weird, but it just means that I, there is a little rowboat that I got to ride around in the anchorage. Um, super fun. Not particularly challenging, but it was some physical exercise. I We were maybe a quarter mile offshore, so I would have to row my way all the way to the beach um, if I wanted to get onto the beach, and then I'd have to row myself back through the waves and then get back to the boat. So that was my physical activity for this past week. I'm looking forward to adding in some more CrossFit during the week, three, maybe four days throughout the week. And then also adding back in some pickleball. I'm really excited about that. Probably starting this coming week, I'll be able to add some pickleball back in to my schedule. I always want to hear about what you guys are doing throughout the week to stay active and moving because that is what this entire podcast is about has how can we stay moving throughout our life diving into today's topics we're going to talk about the science of recovery and how to optimize our rest days and what do good rest days look like and why are they good rest days um if we want to make improvements in our fitness in particular but health as well we need to have some sort of stimulus that happens to the body and as a result of that stimulus we would need to compensate with the body or go into a state of shock and then we would need to have some sort of period of recovery or super compensation and then the goal would be to finish with some heightened level of homeostasis than what was before. That is a really long version of talking about the general adaptation syndrome. The general adaptation syndrome or the GAS is one of the most basic, um, hypothesis when it comes to like active, not active recovery, but recovery from any kind of physiological or neurological stimulus. And it's got three different categories. We have an alarm, a resistance and exhaustion. Um, phase one is alarm, phase two is resistance and phase three is exhaustion. We also have a couple of different um, periods that other scientists have kind of called this as well. We can look at stimulus, we can look at fatigue, then compensation, then supercompensation, then homeostasis. So those are the, the five stages when we're talking about general adaptation syndrome or um, the GAS syndrome. This is kind of vital when we're talking about getting better at anything. And when we want to make improvements, we have to improve our baseline. Um, I've talked about the the um, a load versus capacity. We have a current capacity. The general adaptation would be the scientific theory that's applied to our capacity limits to increase the amount of work that we could complete on any given day. Um, so 
it's a super important thing. The idea is very, very basic that, hey, I have some sort of stimuli, i.e. working out. Because of that workout, the body gets put in a sense of depression, meaning where it's not going to perform as well as it could. Um, once it's in that state of depression or out below homeostasis, and the body gets to work on recovery or what's called compensation that brings that body back up to homeostasis or baseline. Typically, once we've hit baseline, sometimes there is what is called super compensation, which is recovery past what the previous homeostasis is. That's what happens over and over and over and over again. And it happens in several different areas. Um, and the compensation and super compensation is what we are talking about as far as recovery goes. So compensation and super compensation are those two things. Um, one of the things that we need to talk about is what happens when we exercise and that stimulus is hit. Um, typically that is the breakdown of muscle fibers. We talk about some sort of stimulus where the body actually goes into a lower than homeostasis. So when I lift weights, we can do a little example of this. When I lift weights, I'm actually doing damage to my muscle tissue. I'm actually creating some small tears in my muscles when I lift at a, at a moderate to a high intensity weight. When I do damage to those muscles, I go below what my baseline normally would be. When I'm below that baseline, my body senses, hey, you are below baseline. We need to do some sort of recovery in this. So the recovery from that is typically repairing the damage that was done to the muscles. In addition to repairing the damage, it's likely preparing ourselves for the same sort of damage. So that's where super compensation would occur. Um, when I, if my body knows that I'm going to be exposed to that stimulus again, it's not going to just bring me back to that baseline. It's going to um, adapt or super um, compensate past that so that the same stimulus is not going to re result in the same effect. This is why as we get stronger, we can lift more weights. More weights are going to be required to cause the breakdown of muscle tissue. If I continue doing the same weight all the time, there's going to be a point that I am no longer going to super compensate. I'll just return back to homeostasis because the body is already adapting adequately. The, so that's what's happening on the muscular level, like the actual muscles. There's also a... CNS or central nervous system component to that central nervous system has to do with your brain, your spinal cord, and your motor neurons, but it doesn't necessarily have to be motor neurons, but likely when we're talking about movement, it's going to be motor neurons. And what happens in the compensation stage is I am likely strengthening or building new neural pathways. Yes, that can be done. Um, there are nerves that go to all of the muscles in the body, but the amount of electrical signal, signal that is going to each of those muscles, that's how we fire our muscles, right? As we send an electric signal from our brain through our spinal cord into our muscles, the amount of electrical signal that is sent may vary quite a bit. Um, and that can vary based on uh, the parts that are used. And when it's used, there's a, a depression in what's homeostasis. And then there's a compensation and super compensation. And what that looks like, um, we're not really damaging our pathways like we are with muscles, but in our central nervous system, we're actually going to be building pathways. So the joints between um, pathways, you're going to have more um, potential for electric activity. I wish I had a diagram to explain this, but there are mm, axioms and something else. Basically, an electric signal goes from one spot to the next and it's crossing 
a pathway. There, what happens in compensation in that pathway is there is actually, I believe it's minerals, or it might be an enzyme that float between those two areas. And the more of that there is, the easier that that potential will flow back and forth. Now, and the more sensitive it is to electrical signals. The second thing that happens, that's at the, the joint of the nerve. Now there's a long body of the nerve as well. And that long body can be coated in what's called myelin. And when we coat the body of the axon in myelin, the potential, the electric potential moves across that axon much quicker and much smoother. I know that is a very down and dirty explanation of what's going on at the neurological level. But basically what we're doing is we're creating a better setup for the components, right? Hey, what's going to be initiating that transaction of electric potential? And then the ease of the flow. So myelin or increasing the amount of myelin that's on neurons, that's going to ease the flow from axon to axon to axon. Um, one of the cool things that we can also be doing, it's not only with physical adaptation, but it's also with mental um, or cognitive adaptation as well, is we're actually building pathways that didn't exist in the brain before. So maybe we only had one connection between two spots, but now we have three different connections between uh, the same spots. So we can actually build more neural pathways. When that's That's more centered around cognitive improvements or adaptation, but it can also be around physical adaptations as well. So that is the down and dirty of what's happening in recovery or the compensation and super compensation stages for muscle growth and for CNS um, central nervous system growth as well. The One of the other things that we can kind of talk about um, with recovery, as far as um, our body goes, would maybe be like bone density. When we stress bones at one tenth of their breaking force or breaking capacity, then the body is going to, you know, elicit a response. Hey, I've I've hit a, a stimulus. That stimulus is bringing me below my baseline, and as a result, I need to compensate and supercompensate. So, how do bones do that? they're actually going to um, send cells to the bones that increase bone production, which will increase the bone density. Um, all of these things are, are things that we would like to do because without exercise, without physical activity, without the general adaptation syndrome, if we stay at a homeostasis, it is well established that with age, we decline in all of these areas. Our goal is to stop or reverse that decline, get as high as we can as with our capacity, and then maintain that capacity or slow down that decline as much as we possibly can. We want to keep as many neural pathways as we can. We want to keep as much muscle mass as we can, and we want to keep as much bone density as we can. We know that being able to move for our life depends on those three things. The next thing that I want to talk about, so we talk about, okay, that is how recovery happens. Now, when and how, when and when does that happen? How about that? We'll, we'll keep it at that. When does that happen? The biggest time that a lot of recovery happens I'll give you five seconds to guess. Brenda, I'm going to bring a guest, guess, guest, guess in today's podcast. Brenda, when do you think the most recovery happens? Don't look at the answers. When do you think the most recovery happens? Like days or hours or? Um, not days or hours. Which part of your day does the most recovery happen? Sleep. That is correct. Brenda aced that. The most recovery happens 
during sleep. And I want to give a little bit of an overview of like, how does that happen during sleep? That was a good answer, Brenda. Sleeping. Brenda loves sleeping. She is recovering hard <laughs> all the time. With sleep, we can talk about a couple of different things. Neurologically, there are some hormones um, that get played around with. During our wake time, we have elevated levels of a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Its design is not to stress you out in your life. Its design is to keep us alive as humans, be able to respond to stimulus um, and, and act as accordingly. When we sleep, the levels of cortisol that are inside our body or circulating inside our body drop. That's really important because a lot of the recovery functions happen when cortisol levels are dropped. Uh, one of the things that can be increased when cortisol is decreased is growth hormone. Growth hormone also typically increases during sleep. And now why do, why do I say typically? Because sleep has stages and there is not, those hormonal changes don't happen in at all points in your sleep and they don't happen in all stages of your sleep. Um, so the decrease in cortisol levels and the increase in horm uh, growth hormone levels happens during sleep. But let's quickly walk through some of the stages um, of sleep. You could be I'll say there's four different stages. Stage one would be awake, but in bed. That, that would be a, a form of rest, right? You are still uh, conscious. You are not sleeping, obviously, but you are in the horizontal position, likely. The next stage would be light sleep. The light sleep is when you're not physically conscious, but you're probably pretty sensitive to uh, maybe alarm would be the the uh, appropriate um, word for it. Um, you can likely hear, you know, sounds. People would wake you up very easily. This would be a light sleep. The next one would be deep sleep, and we call this slow wave sleep. This is where a lot of the functions of the body get depressed and where a lot of the recovery happens. And deep sleep or slow wave sleep has the greatest effect on physical recovery. Deep sleep has the greatest effect on physical recovery. Then we also have a fourth stage, which is REM sleep or rapid eye movement. And REM sleep has the greatest effect on cognitive recovery. So there, you know, there's two components that are super important on recovery. We've got our deep sleep and our REM sleep. Deep sleep is extremely important for recovery from physical exertions. And REM sleep is extremely important for recovery from cognitive exhaustion. Um, we can make a lot of repairs to tissues uh, muscle tissues, bone tissues during deep sleeps, and we can make a lot of um, improvements in pathways or neurological pathways during REM sleep. It's where a lot of things are organized. It's when a, a lot of things are are filtered in and out as far as memories go as well. Um, so those two different stages, deep sleep and REM sleep, are are critical to recovery. The last thing that I'll talk about is if you have not had some sort of staged um, layout for your recovery, you've never seen that before. Lots there, there is lots of different um, wearable tools. I've got my Garmin watch on right now, but it doesn't have to be a Garmin watch. It could be an Apple watch. It could be an aura ring. It could be a Fitbit a lot of those wearables now help you track which stages of sleep you are in. 
So it can tell you when you're awake, when you're in a light sleep, a deep sleep, and a REM sleep. Obviously, they're not 100% accurate, but getting a good idea of what your baselines are in order to improve your recovery, that can make a big difference. I've found for me that my best recovery comes when I can get two hours of deep sleep and two hours of REM sleep. And they don't happen one after another. And if you see this now on a, on a wearable of some sort, you'll see that you don't do, if I sleep for eight hours, it's not four hours of light sleep, two hours of deep sleep, two hours of REM sleep. You cycle in and out of these uh, sleep cycles. So you'll be in a light sleep, then a deep sleep, and then likely another light sleep, and then a deep sleep, and then another light sleep, and then another deep sleep. And then likely after you've um, completed a few cycles, you will go from a deep sleep to a REM sleep to a light sleep, back to a deep sleep, back to a REM sleep, back to a light sleep. So um, the amount of, of deep sleep and REM sleep that you get actually increases the longer that you sleep. Uh, so the, the physical recovery of the body is inhibited significantly when we do not sleep enough hours. The body's figured out a really cool way to bypass deep sleep and only get REM sleep as necessary. I think that this is a, a um, physiological adaptation to potentially um, having kids or raising young. The body needed to figure out a way that it could cognitively survive with very little sleep. Um, so not recommended at all because physical recovery is significantly diminished, but the body can, in periods of low amounts of sleep, still get adequate REM sleep for cognitive function, even with very minimal amounts of sleep, meaning for three to five hours of sleep, you could cognitively get a decent amount of REM sleep in that amount of time when the body needs it or has it as, as absolutely necessary. That likely doesn't happen on a random night that you only got five hours. Your body did not automatically assume that you are in a state of exhaustion and need more REM sleep. So that's not how that works, but it can happen over repeated uh, days or weeks when the sleep is very low. The body knows, hey, I need to get some REM sleep here. So it's going to adjust, skip some deep sleep cycles and go straight to REM sleep um, in order to get the, the cognitive recovery in touch although you're going to be skipping that physical recovery with deep sleep. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is active versus passive recovery. Active recovery, the only reason that I would like to talk about active recovery is active recovery can talk about the increase of blood flow throughout the body. Active recovery is, is something that's a monostructural um, movement that is going to promote circulation, reduce muscle stiffness, stiffness. Um, but the goal or the point of that is not to create additional adaptation. So active recovery is very difficult to do in practice. And the point of it is to increase blood flow to certain parts of the body. When we can increase blood flow, we may be able to enhance muscle recovery. Um, our, all of the body um, nutrients are transported by blood, including muscles. So the, the adaptation that needs to happen from muscles happens from blood flow. Um, if I can increase blood flow in an area, I may be able to enhance recovery or shorten recovery. Passive recovery would be something like completely resting or sleeping. That would be passive recovery, like abstaining from physical activity. <laughs> uh, I would say likely when you're training something like CrossFit and there is a big need for muscular repair, 
active recovery can have its benefits, meaning I can increase blood flow to an area with a very low intensity uh, movement, like some sort of monostructural biking, running, um, rowing, um, and some sort of stretching or mobility that's going to promote blood flow and reduce stiffness overall. overall. That increased blood flow could potentially help recovery um, as well. Recap, we've talked about a couple of different things. First thing is the general adaptation syndrome, where we have the three-phase response, alarm, resistance, and adaptation or uh, exhaustion. The other way to think about the general adaptation syndrome is we've got stimulus, fatigue, compensation, and supercompensation, the roles that that plays in recovery. Then we talk about the central nervous system, what's going on. So with the general adaptation syndrome, what's going on with muscles, what's going on with central nervous system. With muscles, we're actually physically making tears or damage to the muscles. Adaptation is the repair and supercompensation of the damage. Central nervous system, we are not damaging our neurons. Um, we are building pathways and strengthening connections between pathways. Those are the two things that are happening with the general adaptation syndrome as it comes to our central nervous system. Then we talk about sleep. We talk about two different things with sleep. We talked about the hormonal changes. We've got decreases in cortisol and increases in, in human growth hormone or growth hormone. Then we also talked about the stages of sleep. We have awake, we have light sleep, we have deep sleep, and we have REM sleep. You know, briefly touched on your deep sleep has to do with your physical recovery, and your REM sleep has to do with your cognitive recovery. And then final thing is active versus passive recovery. Passive would be something like sleeping or completely resting, where active recovery is something like monostructural work where you're improving blood flow to an area or you are um, reducing muscle stiffness in order to need recovery or the entire point of exercise or stimulus is providing the body an opportunity to recover with that recover we get the super compensation or the adaptation that comes our ultimate goal is the adaptation, right? We want to increase bone density. We want to increase muscle mass. Um, and we want to increase cognitive function for as long as we possibly can. And then we want to maintain it for as long as we possibly can. That is the point of all of this. Thank you for listening. If this was a helpful episode, understanding recovery and how it happens in the body, I want you to share this with a friend. If you have questions about anything that I talked about, uh, send me a comment on our YouTube page or send me an email to colby at oxnarmovement.com. I'm more than happy to answer your emails or questions about the general adaptation syndrome or recovery in general. Have a great Thursday. We will see you all next week. Stay moving. Stay happy. Not